Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I am very happy that, that at least some people are present in the audience. Yes, my name is Jora Shlapnikov. I work at the Laboratory of Theoretical Physics and Statistical Models in Orsay, near Paris, France. At the same time, six years ago, I founded a theory group at the Russian Quantum Center, and I'm also part-time professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. You see how many affiliations I have. Then, uh, it's my first visit to Sao Paulo. I have, I have been to Brazil many times, once in Rio de Janeiro and several times in Natal, where they have the International Institute, yes. And uh, I was very happy when I looked in, the, in my computer, which last week was saying that the weather here is plus 25, plus 28, etc. Then suddenly it said that, wow, it is 16 today, slightly warmer tomorrow. But it's okay. You know that before coming here, I was in Singapore, which, which is right on the equator. And the weather there is quite different from what we have here. So before I start my lectures, uh, I would like to say that I am grateful to the organizers for inviting me. Yes. And uh, so I will try to spend here time with useful discussions, interesting prospects, and so on. And now let me start my lectures. So according to the program, I am supposed to speak about dipolar quantum gases. But before I start speaking about dipolar quantum gases, just 15 minutes ago, I realized after discussions with Yoke and Misha Baranov that you did not get uh, let's say, introduction to Bose-Einstein condensation. People did, the lecturers did not introduce gross pitayevsky equation, equations for the excitations, and so on. Therefore, what I will do, I will use one of my old files and uh, giving introduction to Bose-Einstein condensation. Yes? So that's what it is. And, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, excuse me, uh, when we talk about Bose-Einstein condensation, we usually pronounce the word that this is macroscopic occupation of a single quantum state with identical bosons, yes? So, there is a single quantum state, so single single particle state. Then you put many bosons in this state, and this is called Bose-Einstein condensation. This phenomenon has been predicted by Bose and Einstein in 1924, and since that time, people call it Bose-Einstein condensation. In fact, I would like to say that if you look in the original papers, uh, that Bose did it for photons, yes? And Einstein has extended this theory to, to, to particles and so on, yes? And for this reason, people are used to say Bose-Einstein condensation, yes, this phenomenon. Uh, then uh, people are dealing with this phenomenon already for many tens of years, because you meet the phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation in superfluid helium-4, yes? And, but it's a strongly interacting system. It's a liquid. And uh, only in 1995, Bose-Einstein condensation in dilute <coughs> atomic vapors has been discovered in experiments at Gila in Colorado by Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman, and at MIT by Wolgan Ketterle, yes? Uh, in Gila, these were rubidium-87 atoms. Uh, in, uh, in the group of Olden Ketterle, this was sodium atom. So what you do, you have a magnetic trap, which keeps particles with the required spin polarization, and others are thrown away. So you get identical bosons 
in a certain in a certain volume, which is confined by a magnetic trap. Then you lower the trap barrier, high energy particles escape, low energy particles remain, stay there, they, they collide and re-thermalize and acquire lower and lower temperatures. And eventually, people reach the temperature of Bose Einstein condensation. This is called evaporative cooling. Yes, that's what it is. But before I turn to Bose Einstein condensation, let us first understand what we are dealing with, what kind of length scales we have in the system. Here, imagine please that you have many particles, yes? And then what are the length scales? First of all, thermal de Broglie wavelength, which is inversely proportional to temperature and mass in the power of one half. Each particle, according to what we know, is, is at the same time a wave. And then, depending on the particle energy, uh, you may introduce the wavelength. And this is this, this quantity, at, at energy equal temperature. There is a characteristic radius of interparticle interaction, which is this one. If particles are far from each other at distances which are much larger than this Re, they do not interact. But once they approach each other at a distance of the order of Re or smaller, they start interacting with each other. And a very important third distance scale, the mean interparticle separation, mean separation between particles in the volume, which is in the three-dimensional case, is density in the power minus one third. So when this guy, the mean interparticle separation, is much larger than the characteristic radius of interaction, yes, then this is called dilute limit. And this is actually the case where we can talk about the gas phase, because if this inequality is not satisfied, then particles are tightly confined, they just hitting each other all the time, and this is a liquid, yes. Then uh, I go to the comparison of the thermal de Broglie wavelength and the characteristic radius of interaction. Again, if the thermal de Broglie wavelength is much larger than this Re, or this condition is satisfied where this is the thermal wave vector, we have the so-called ultra-cold limit. Ultra-cold limit is remarkable in the sense that when particles collide, only S-wave collisions are important. Yes, S wave collisions are collisions with zero orbital angular momentum. I think that Jörg Valraven was discussing with you this phenomenon. First, ultra cold gas was the gas of atomic, spin polarized atomic hydrogen. It has been created in 1979 in Amsterdam in the experiments of Ike Silvera and Jörg Valraven. First, ultra-cold gas, and the density was 10 to the 16th particles per cubic centimeter at temperatures 300 millikelvin. It's not yet Bose-Einstein condensation, it's a thermal gas. Now, let us turn to energy scales. The obvious energy scale which we have in the gas is temperature, yes, T. Then interaction between particles introduces another energy scale. One can show the interaction for two particles in the ultra-cold limit when the interaction is short range, van der Waals at large distances, uh, is G, coupling constant, divided by the volume. And this G is h bar squared divided by the mass and multiplied by a certain quantity which has a dimension of length. And this is the so-called scattering length. The total interaction energy for identical bosons is given by this relation. G divided by V multiplied the number of bosons in the square. Interaction energy per particles is density multiply this uh, coupling strength G. In the present experiments with bosons and also with fermions, um, with ultra-cold bosons and fermions, we have densities from 10 to 12 to 10 to the 14th particles per cubic centimeter, and number of particles from 100,000 to 10 to 100 million particles. And 
the interaction, the interaction energy per particle is in between 1 and 100 nanokelvin. And temperature is varying from 10 nanokelvin to 1 microkelvin. Here, just to, mm. to confirm my knowledge and may, maybe to improve your knowledge a little bit, I would say that until recently, the world record in cooling particles was 500 picocalvin. It was Wolfgang Ketterle who did it in the gas phase for Bose-Einstein condensate, then expanding it in a trap. Then in a later stage, people for particles in the lattice reached 300 nanokelvin, 300 picocalvin, yes. But such temperatures are extremely low, and the aim of those experiments was just to show that they can be reached, because at such temperatures you can do very little without destroying the system, yes? So, now, uh, about, about the statistics. When, um, okay, when the uh, mean separation between particles is much larger than the thermal de Broglie wavelength, or this inequality is satisfied, we have Boltzmann statistics. Yes, it's our ordinary Boltzmann statistics. If I look at the air in this room, it obeys Boltzmann statistics, and the characteristic density will be 2 multiplied 10 to the 19th particles per cubic centimeter. If I made a mistake, please correct me later. Yes? So, when the product of density in thermal de Broglie wavelength in the power of 3 is of order 1, then quantum statistics comes into play, which means that the mean interparticle separation is of the order of the thermal de Broglie wavelength. This guy, n lambda t in the power of three, is called degeneracy parameter, you know? And then when it is of order one, yes, we have the so-called degeneracy temperature given by this expression, density in the power of two-thirds divided by the mass. You know what is remarkable? When particles are very far from each other and the mean interparticle separation is much larger than the thermal de Broglie wavelength, then the, they more or less don't care whether they are bosons, fermions, identical or not. But when the de Broglie wavelength becomes of the order of the mean interparticle separation, then, then quantum mechanics seriously comes into play. And then the particles start to know who they are bosons, fermions, or whoever else, yes? And then what we usually do, we consider weakly interacting regime where we introduce the mean distance between particles, which is density to the power of minus one third, yes? A temperature tending to zero, the kinetic energy in the box of containing one particle is h bar square divided by m, the size of the box and the square. The particle wave function is not influenced by the interaction with other particles. If this guy, the kinetic energy, is much larger than interaction energy per particle, ng, which means that n modulus a in the power of three is much smaller than one. This is a very important inequality because it allows us to construct the so-called many-body perturbation theory. And when people wish to do a little bit of analytics, or completely analytics, they rely on this inequality. So, the end, as I already told you, when the mean separation between particles is of the order of the thermal de Broglie wavelength, then quantum statistics comes into play. If we have identical bosons, we eventually get Bose-Einstein condensation. How this is actually done, what you write down first is the Hamiltonian, h bar squared k squared divided by 2m multiplied ak dagger ak, where this is the annihilation operator and the creation operator of a particle with, with momentum k. I should better say wave vector k. But in my lectures, I will, I will not make a distinction between wave vector and momentum, yes? So, and the chemical potential is smaller than zero. Uh, the mean number of particles in the state with momentum k 
is unity divided by exponent in the power ek minus mu divided by t minus one. This is both a distribution function where ek is just the kinetic energy of a single particle. And then what we can do, we can calculate the total number of particles, sum over k and k. Sum over k is integral v multiplied d3k divided by two pi in the power of three and the distribution function. And then, and then we get this curve. At high temperatures, the chemical potential, which is in here, as a function of temperature is large and negative, the, the stuff known from the classical statistics. But then, when temperature is decreasing, the chemical potential is approaching zero, and at a, at a temperature Tc, it becomes zero. And at lower temperatures, this equation has no solution. And this Tc is given by this formula. So it's the degeneracy temperature multiplied the numerical factor of order unity. So what to do? And this actually has been solved by Bose and Einstein, yes, who said that this is not a big problem. The thing is that at T smaller than Tc, we assume that the macroscopic number of particles goes to the state k equals zero. And the total number of particles is this number at k equals zero plus particles with momenta k larger than zero, yes? And then uh, this distribution is given with chemical potential zero, yes? And then the number of particles with momenta larger than zero is given by this relation, yes? And it's n, total number of particles multiplied t divided by tc in the power of three half. And then the number of particles with zero momentum is given by this relation, yes? So we call it condensation in the momentum space, yes? Because these, all these particles have momentum zero. So, so this is Bose-Einstein condensation. Yes, I actually demonstrated this Bose-Einstein condensation with a very simple example, non-interactic identical bosons in three dimensions. Yes, that's what it is. I would say at this point that our life is not that simple. If instead of three dimensions, I turn to two dimensions, yes, then, in free space, I have this relation for the total number of particles through the Bose-Einstein distribution. A is the surface area. And I get that the chemical potential is minus temperature logarithm of this quantity. All the time, when I decrease temperature from large to small, the chemical potential is finite and negative. It becomes zero only at zero temperature. So what we see we see that there is no Bose-Einstein condensation at a finite temperature in contrast to three dimensions. One can only say that there is Bose-Einstein condensation at zero temperature, not more than that. Yes? In order to understand a little bit better what the difference is, what I propose you to do is to do an exercise, yes? At home, or where you live now. You are all from Sao Paulo? I guess that no. Some of you are from somewhere else. Are you all from Brazil? No, okay. Moreover, so which means that you live in hotels or wherever, yes? So, let us introduce the quantity called density of states, yes? Number of states per unit energy interval. This is delta function, energy minus energy as a function of k, integral v multiplied d dk, where d is the dimension, yes? And then it is given by this relation, yes? And then we see that for chemical potential tending to zero, in 3D, the density of states is proportional to square root of energy. In 2D, it is energy independent, and in 1D, it's unit divided by square root of energy. So now we see 
by comparing the two-dimensional and three-dimensional cases that uh, for the density of states decreasing with energy, one cannot distribute a given number of particles according to the Bose-Einstein distribution below a certain critical temperature, yes? So just because the density of states is decreasing, getting the zero when E is tending to zero, yes? But for this case, you can do that, yes? You can also do it in the one-dimensional case, yes? And uh, I would say that this shows you if your density of states as a function of energy is such that with decreasing energy it decreases, this means that you will that below a certain critical temperature, which you should find, you cannot distribute particles among low energy state according to the Bose-Einstein distribution. Yes? And then if you have an external potential, you may use a quasi-classical approach and calculate the density of states according to this formula, E minus E over K minus V over R, D D K D D R to power in the power, to pi in the in the power D. And, and both the Einstein condensation in power law potentials has been nicely investigated. There is a very nice paper by Bagnato and Kleppner, which dates back to 1991. This is the same Bagnato who works in this country, yes, I think in San Carlos, yes. So he was working with Dan Kleppner a long time ago, yes. That's what it is. Uh, now, let me turn to something else regarding Bose-Einstein condensation, yes, uh, because I told you something about Bose-Einstein condensation of bosons which do not interact with each other, which is an extreme case, and we all know that particles actually interact with each other, yes, and Oi. Uh, again, I consider weakly interacting regime where NG, interaction energy per particle, is sufficiently small, yes? And then at temperatures much smaller than the critical temperature, almost all particles are in the Bose-Einstein condensate, like in an ideal gas. If you, will, if you look back here, yes, you see that here in the three-dimensional case, if temperature is tending to zero, much smaller than Tc, then practically N0 is almost equal to the total number of particles, yes. In the ideal gas, non-interacting particles, this is the case. And we assume implicitly that this is also the case if the interaction is weak, yes. So, then the interaction energy, total interaction energy, is number of particles in the square divided by the volume multiplied this G. Imagine now that this G is negative, which means that interaction energy is negative, yes, and when I uh, decrease V, the volume is becoming smaller, the interaction energy is also becoming smaller. So E V like this, yes? It is energetically favorable for the system to occupy smaller and smaller volume, and it means that the system collapses, yes, in free space. Now, if the coupling constant is positive, then I write down the Hamiltonian. For those who are experimentalists, don't be afraid of, of psi operators. Uh, this is psi dega psi. Uh, this is the, the annihilation operator uh, which annihilates particle at the point R, and this guy creates particle in the point R, yes? This is the interaction with the external potential, oilala, yes? And uh, this is the interaction between particles, which contains four operators. The Heisenberg equation of motion is given by this relation, Psi H minus H Psi, it's given by this relation. Then Psi can be written down as Psi zero 
this is the field operator of particles in the condensate plus something small, which is psi prime. And then when I look at this equation and put all psi's equal to psi zero, which is a C number, I get the Gross-Pitayevsky equation, which has been derived by Gross and Pitayevsky in 1961 or 63, I forgot exactly the year. The papers of Gross and Pitayevsky were published all, almost at the same time, although, as it usually happens, yes, People are saying that Landau was telling Pitayevsky that it's too early to publish this paper, you have to study, and so on. Yes? Okay. Because Pitayevsky actually introduced vortices in this paper, and Landau was completely sure at that time that vortices in the three-dimensional case are unstable because these helical oscillations of the vortex line. Yes? But this is just history of a long time ago. It's simply interesting to tell you about that. This is the gross pita time-dependent gross pita equation. In the equilibrium state, psi zero depends on time through exponent in the power i mu t, and when you substitute this here, you get stationary gross pita equation, yes, which was used in God knows how many papers to calculate the condensate wave function and to obtain what is the shape of the condensate. Yes. Before I will say you something about that, I would like to introduce a very important quantity, which is called healing length. Let us assume that we have free space, yes, in two directions, y and z, the system is infinite, but in the x direction, yes, there is an infinite wall at x equals zero, so that the condensate wave function here is zero. Then the condensate wave function depends only on x, and this is the stationary gross pitayevsky equation. At zero, it is zero. At infinity here, it's square root of the density. And then assuming that psi zero is real, you get this expression through the hyperbolic tangent of x divided by xi, where xi is h bar divided by square root of m and g. It is called healing length. Uh, the condensate wave function behaves itself like this when I depart from zero and approach infinity. It is practically square root of n zero when the distance uh, from the wall is of order xi or two or three xi, like this. Yes, and this is a very important quantity which allows you to judge whether you reach the limit of, let's say, almost coordinate independent condensate wave function. Yes. Now, what people usually do, they get bosons or fermions in a harmonic trap, yes, which is usually either magnetic or optical trap, but this is Let's assume that we have a spherical trap, m omega squared r squared divided by two, three-dimensional case. This is the frequency of the trap. This is the particle mass. This is the stationary gross pitayevsky equation, yes? For g equals zero, when particles do not interact with each other, what do we get? Huh? Who knows? Everybody should know that this is the harmonic oscillator equation. And the condensate wave function is nothing else than the ground state harmonic oscillate. And the chemical potential is 3 half h omega. In fact, this type of expression is valid when the interaction between particles is much smaller than the trap frequency, which means that this is the distance between the trap levels, and the interaction between particles is that small. And you don't care over the interaction anymore. When this is not true and the interaction between particles is much larger than h omega, which means that this is the distance between the trap levels and the interaction is much larger. In this case, the interaction smears out the discrete structure of the trap levels. You may drop the kinetic energy term from this equation, and you get this algebraic equation for the condensate wave function, yes? People call this Thomas Fermi regime. There is an analogy with the atom. And this has been, for the first time, introduced by Tony Leggett in 1981. You know, 
And this is the expression for the condensate wave function. And it is non-zero only at a certain distance smaller than the Thomas Fermi radius, which is given by square root of chemical potential divided by the mass unit divided by omega. This is actually the uh, form of the condensate wave function right here. Yes, this is my trapping potential. And then using this relation, we can establish a, re a relation between the chemical potential coupling constant G and number of particles. Yes, we can actually establish that the healing length is much smaller than the harmonic oscillator length, which one would expect in this case and so on. Yes. Actually, most of the experiments for many, many years, when people did experiments with bosons, Bose-Einstein condensate in harmonic traps, we were dealing with this Thomas Fermi regime. It's a very important regime because what people were doing after creating the Bose-Einstein condensate, they were switching off the trap and the condensate was expanding. And then people were just investigating the character of the expansion and so on. Yes. Okay, so this is a very, yes, so this is what I was going. No, now I stop at this point. Yes, and uh, so this is something that I was going to tell you about some general words about Bose-Einstein condensation. Now I have a question to the chairman. You are a chairman, yes? Um, so how much time exactly do I have for the lecture? Uh, one hour and a half or so. If you can choose 10 minutes for questions. Yes, so one hour and some minutes, yes? Okay, so if I finish after one hour, five minutes, one hour, 10, 15 minutes, it's okay. Yes? Okay, good. Because now what I will have to do, I will have to turn to another file because now I would like to really uh, turn to dipole quantum gases. Yes? Okay, here is my file about dipole quantum gases with all my affiliations which I told you about and so on, even with the date of today. So, when I was telling you about Bose-Einstein condensation, I was first dealing with non-interacting bosons and then, and then with bosons which in interact with each other via short-range interaction, Van der Waals interaction at large distances where the interaction can be reduced to this coupling constant G, yes? And then what I have done, I have shown what is the healing length and how one can obtain the density profile of a condensate in an external potential, in particular in a harmonic trap. But it's very important to remember that it's not always the case that the interaction between particles is short range, yes? For neutral particles, and I will only discuss neutral particles, I will not discuss ions and Coulomb interaction. There is a class of particles where this is not the case. And these are the so-called dipole particles, yes? Yes? For example, these are polar molecules, so atoms with a large magnetic moment, yes, where you, for example, polarize this magnetic or electric dipole moment in one direction. And then there is the so-called dipole-dipole interaction, interaction between two dipoles, which is given by this relation. It's inversely proportional to the distance between particles and the power three. 
and where R big is the distance, yes? D1 and D2 are the dipole moments. It is very important to remember that this interaction has two important features. First of all, it's long range. In 3D, it's absolutely long range. In 2D, to some extent, yes. And second, it is an isotropic. Two dipoles like that, dipoles like that, if you look at this formula, this, only this term is important, they repel each other. And two dipoles like that, they attract each other, yes? So the interaction is anisotropic. Then, and, and already from these two features, you would guess that they lead to the physics which is different from the physics of ordinary atomic ultra cold gases, which I was talking about slightly before. Just to uh, uh, say at this moment that for alkali atom molecules, these, these are polar molecules, and, and polar molecule is a molecule consisting of two different atoms, yes? For example, for potassium rubidium molecules, uh, when I go from th this type of molecule to lithium cesium, the dipole moment changes from 0.6 dBi to 5.5 dBi. Just to make your life a little bit simpler, who knows what is the what kind of unit is dBi? Silence. D divide the number in dBi by 2.4, and you get atomic unit. Atomic unit is electron charge multiplied Bohr radius. It's very simple. So when people will be giving you the number of the dipole, the, uh, the dipole moment in Debye, divide by 2.4, and you get atomic units, so, which is very easy. Yes, that's what it is. So as I already told you, uh, these dipolar particles are either uh, are either part are either polar molecules or atoms with a large magnetic moment. Yes, because here I oi, here I put electric dipole moment, but the same e equation is valid for the so-called magnetic dipole interaction, where D will be the magnetic moment. Yes, so we either have to obtain polar molecules, heteronuclear molecules with a large dipole moment, or we have to obtain atoms with a large magnetic moment, yes? Certainly, to obtain molecules, these heteronuclear molecules in the ground, in the ground state, it's fairly difficult and people were first dealing with atoms which have a large magnetic moment. And the first atom of this type is chromium atom, where the magnetic moment is six Bohr magneton. Compared to atomic hydrogen, it's factor six. And if you go back to this relation, you will see that the interaction is proportional magnetic moment in the square, so six in the square is 36. And when you study co collisional phenomena, yes, uh, from the lectures of York, you probably grabbed that the collisional rates are proportional to the interaction in the square. So 36 in the square is more than 1,000. So that's what it is. And remarkable experiments have been done with this chromium atom, first in the group of Tilman Pfau in Stuttgart, effects of dipole-dipole interaction in the dynamic stability diagram of trapped dipole, a BEC, in, in a later stage, spinor physics of chromium uh, in, in experiments at Wiltanus in the group of Bruno Labuche Tolra. Then, somewhat later, people also obtained was the Einstein condensation, because chromium was not just obtained like that. It has been Bose condensed. People obtained Bose Einstein condensation of dysprosium atom, where the magnetic moment is 10 Bohr magnetons, and erbium atom, where it is 7 Bohr magnetons. Yes? So people have quite 
a spectrum of, let's say, uh, magnetic atoms, yes? But what people were also doing, they were doing experiments uh, trying to create ultra-cold polar molecules. And the first success in this direction was at Gila, the same place where the first Bose-Einstein condensation of atoms has been obtained, but by different people, yes, in the experiments in the group of Debbie Jean and Jun Ye. Jun Ye is continuing the experiments in the direction of uh, heteronuclear molecules. Debbie Jean unfortunately died a few years ago, yes, which was a big loss for the community of ultra-cold matter. Yes, and what they have done, they have obtained potassium rubidium molecules, yes, which are fermionic. Potassium-40 is a fermion, rubidium-87 is a boson. Then what you first do, you first create a, a very weakly bound state of the, this molecule using the so-called Feshbach resonance. I think that yolk, Jörg, did you discuss Feshbach resonance? Yes, Jörg discussed Feshbach resonance with you. Then you obtain this molecule. You then excite it to the electronically excited state and transfer to the ground raw vibrational state. When I pronounce the term raw vibrational, it means rotational and vibrational, yes? And that's what has been done in these groups at densities 10 to 12, 10 to the 13th at temperatures of the order of 200 nanokelvin, and temperature was approaching the Fermi energy, which means that the gas was close to be degenerate. Unfortunately, this was not sufficient. Why? Here, uh, the efforts of this, of this group, and in a later stage of other groups, to observe interesting and remarkable, exciting many-body physics was stopped by ultra-cold chemistry. You know, collisional people, theoreticians, etc., and all physical chemistry people were extremely happy with this ultra-cold chemistry. And us, many-body theorists, and people do very nice many-body physics, we were very unhappy. But let me tell you the truth. After that, you will realize why and who was happy and unhappy. Ultra-cold chemical reactions, for example, potassium rubidium plus potassium rubidium, two molecules collide, and they form potassium two molecule plus rubidium two molecule, and this is energetically favorable, yes? And since this is energetically favorable, this is happening. Then people were uh, pronouncing the words that the, there are new trends in ultra-code chemistry and so on. Very many words have been pronounced. Very many, let's say, conferences and workshops have been organized by people, yes? But certainly, what we understand is something very simple. If we can suppress this, uh, this bloody ultra-code chemistry, then we're in. Imagine that we have a two-dimensional geometry. What you do, you tightly confine your molecules in one direction, yes? And then you get dipoles, which are perpendicular to the layer, yes? So like that. And what we understand is that the dipoles like that, they repel each other. This is their repulsive interaction potential, yes? And once they repel each other, it's very difficult for them to approach each other at short interparticle distances where these outer cold chemistry reactions occur. Yes? And, uh, and they have done this experiment at Gila in the group of Debbie Jean and Jun Ye. And what they have obtained, they obtained the reduction by one or almost two orders of magnitude in between one and two. Unfortunately, this was not sufficient to, to start studying many-body physics. They could do it better, reduce uh, this rate by three, four orders of magnitude. Why they did not do it? Because, you know, when you confine particles, they are still 
moving in this tightly confined direction, when they collide, they become at small distances, partially 3D. And this increases the rate of uh, ultra-cold chemical reaction. If you confine stronger, then uh, the rate of this ultra-cold chemical reaction becomes smaller. They confined it with the frequency of 30 kilohertz, which is very large. In principle, they could try to confine it with a higher frequency up to 100 kilohertz, but they turned uh, the research in a slightly different direction. So what people started then to do is the following. Of course, they realized that try to invent a geometry which allows you to strongly reduce the rate of ultra-cold chemical reactions, yes, or what is important, try to find molecules which do not undergo this type of reactions, yes, right? And these are uh, sodium, potassium, potassium, cesium, rubidium, cesium molecules, yes, and then try to create such molecules in the ground state, ground raw vibrational state, and then study many body physics. Uh, until this moment, potassium, rubidium, potassium sodium molecules have been already created in the ground raw vibrational state, in particular in experiments of Martin Zwirlein, yes, and some other molecules have been, uh, rubidium cesium molecules are obtained in experiments of Hans Christoph Nagel, and so on. So people are working in this direction, but very nice, many body physics did not yet come out. Yes, it is still in future, right? That's what it is. Now, let me continue. So, in present experiments, we have first generation of magnetic atom experiments, yes, uh, which is in the group of Tillman Pfau in Stuttgart, Bruno Laburchi at Wiltenhoes, at Stanford and Stuttgart with Dysprosium, also now in Innsbruck uh, with Ergum and Dysprosium, in Florence with Dysprosium and so on, yes. We have many groups working in this direction and they actually performed very interesting experiments in a later stage, which is likely to be tomorrow. I will tell you something about uh, the most interesting experiments which are very recent this year, yes. Ground state polar molecules also have been created. Potassium rubidium and Gila also in Innsbruck, oy, oy, oy. Uh, Then mm, uh, sodium potassium and sodium lithium experiments at MIT and sodium potassium in München then uh, sodium rubidium in Hong Kong, and then also lithium, cesium, and, C and calcium fluoride at Harvard. These are two different groups. So the main goal of all these guys is to um, reveal the role of dipolar interactions. Yes, this was the initial goal, and now, of course, to observe exciting many-body physics, yes, and so on. Here, I would like to make a small re lyrical deviation in the following direction. Uh, there are molecules which are the lightest diatomic molecules, sodium, lithium, yes, which have a dipole moment more than one dibai, yes. And these molecules, they are reactive they undergo the ultra-cold chemistry reaction, sodium-lithium, plus sodium-lithium goes to sodium-2 plus lithium-2. And these molecules have been created in experiments of Wolgan Ketterle at MIT, yes? And as sometimes happens with Wolgan Ketterle, uh, his experiments turn out to be extremely interesting. Why? 
because these reactive molecules turned out to be such that this process is slow. They are weakly reactive molecules. It occurs, but the rate is slow. Therefore, he was able to create significant densities of those molecules and so on. And the interesting experiments with them in 3D, 2D, or 1D, or whatever, are underway. Yes? These are likely to be molecules which belong to the so-called Hund case B. Do you know what are uh, the Hund cases of molecular bond? Did you study quantum mechanics, diatomic molecule? You did not, or you did. Who knows what is Hund case A and what is Hund case B? Even York, Misha, <laughs> Are silent. This is actually very simple. Yes, imagine that your molecule has spin. Yes, then and molecule rotates. Yes, and the question is does the spin rotate together with the internuclear axis? Yes, or it's more or less decoupled from the, the rotation of the internuclear axis. The in internuclear axis rotates and the spin is standing. The first case is Hund case A, and the second case is Hund case B. And there are more, more complicated cases. Yes? You know that uh, this is a very interesting stuff. Usually, people who do condensed metaphysics and uh, let's say diagrammatic techniques and so on, they all the time pronounce words. Read 10 volumes of Landau Lifshitz, but themselves, they have never read volume number three completely. They have missed the chapter, two chapters, diatomic, d d d d d diatomic molecule and, and multi-atomic molecules in that book. And in that book, all this is nicely explained. One may ask Lev Pitayevsky about this, because he is the one who was re-editing these volumes during a very long time, yes? And uh, that's what it is. It is quite likely that the sodium-lithium molecule belongs to the Hun case B, and now people are working in this direction. They just study what one can do with electric and magnetic fields acting on this molecule and so on. So uh, I would say that very interesting experiments are underway. Yes? Now I would like to say something else about all this. First of all, about the radius of the dipole-dipole interaction. So let us imagine that there are two dipoles which interact with each other at a distance r via the dipole-dipole interaction potential, which is unit divided by r cube. Yes? And this is their relative momentum. And then there is a characteristic distance called r star and at this distance, the characteristic kinetic energy, h bar squared divided by m r star squared, is of the order of the dipole-dipole interaction. And this r star is m d squared divided by h bar squared. A distance is much smaller than r star, or just of the order of r star or smaller. The presence of this interaction potential is very, very important. It influences the wave function. Yes? Uh, if the distance between particles is much larger than this quantity, then this is a free relative motion. What remains of the dipole-dipole interaction is only the boundary condition, yes? And this R star is 50 Bohr radius for chromium atoms, and it is huge, up to million Bohr radius for polar molecules. Depends on their dipole moment, yes? For example, the ultra-cold limit, K R star, much smaller than 1. For chromium atoms, it requires temperature smaller than 1 millikelvin. For larger dipole moment or larger magnetic moment, this temperature is smaller. 
Yes, so there is a characteristic distance which tells you at which distances between particles their wave function is influenced by the dipole-dipole interaction and at which distances it's only a boundary condition. Yes, it is important uh, to understand that this distance is dipole moment in the square. The larger is the dipole moment, the larger is this distance. But also the mass is important. The heavier is the ultra cold particles, the larger is the distance R star. This is a bit counterintuitive from the beginning, but that's what it is. Therefore, when people are doing experiments with heavy atoms, which have a fairly large magnetic moment, it's also useful for dipole-dipole effects. For example, recently, I, I think for the first time it was done in the very end of last year, and also this year, people at the Russian Quantum Center obtained Bose-Einstein condensation of two Lume atoms, the atom with which nobody worked before. It simply turned out that for them, this atom is very convenient because they have optics for it. And then this tulium is very heavy, it's 160 or 70 something, almost 200 proton masses, yes. And the, and the magnetic moment of this atom is four Bohr magneton. It is smaller than in the case of chromium, yes, but it is significant and one can expect interesting dipole-dipole effects, yes. Let me continue. Now I turn to the quantity which is called scattering or interaction amplitude. Um, imagine again two particles interacting via the dipole-dipole potential. And there is also a short-range potential, U over R. Yes. Then the scattering amplitude, according to the general expression, is the true wave function with momentum k, yes, multiplied the full interaction potential, multiplied the uh, plane wave, yes. This ki and kf for elastic scattering, they can, they can only have different directions, doesn't matter, but the model is equal. In the ultra-cold limit, k r star much smaller than one, yes, uh, when I put the dipole-dipole interaction, v dipole zero, I put that F is equal to G, the short range coupling constant proportional to the scattering length. What this V dipole does, if I consider K equals zero, yes, then uh, this is this expression and this is constant, but this, con so it's G, but G may depend on the dipole moment, yes? So nothing changes, only the value of the Coupling constant is different. But for k non equal to zero, the situation changes. Yes. For example, I put this, put k equal zero for small distances, and you again get this coupling constant g. But then at large distances, what you do, you keep the wave functions. You put this wave function as a plane wave you get this expression, and you get d squared multiplied 3 cosine squared theta minus 1. Yes, and that's what it is. So what you get in the end is that the full scattering amplitude is the coupling constant g plus d squared multiplied the angular dependence. This is the angle between the dipole moment and the relative wave vector. Yes. Here at this point, I would like to mention something. When you start learning quantum mechanics, scattering theory, please pay attention to something which is called anomalous scattering, yes? Uh, and the, uh, the so-called anomalous scattering is important for particles with long-range interaction. With short-range interaction, all scattering events occur at, at a distance of the order of the characteristic radius of interaction, and then we get all these numbers, g and so on. But for long-range interaction, which is unit divided by r cube in three dimensions, what is important 
it is the scattering at distances of the order of the De Broglie wavelength of particles. You know, the distance is enormous, yes? But the interaction potential is long range. And then, and this may give an important contribution to the scattering amplitude. And this is called anomalous scattering, yes? And this quantity here, which I actually here, this is the result of this anomalous scattering. About the anomalous scattering, you may find the description in volume number three of landau lifshitz quantum mechanics. Yes, it's not that complicated, even for experimentalists. Yes. So now, what I would like to do, I am already talking one hour. Yes. Is it correct? Would you allow me to take five, ten more minutes and then get questions? Or I... Yes. Okay. So now, once I derived the interaction amplitude, I can discuss both the Einstein condensation of dipolar bosons in free space. So what this is, the Hamiltonian, this is the kinetic energy term, this is Laplacian, the field operators, this is the short range interaction, and here I have written down the dipole-dipole interaction between particles. Psi dagger, psi dagger, psi psi, v dipole. The same dipole interaction which, I was, which is unit divided by r cube. So I did not say you anything about the Bogolubov approach. And unfortunately, my great uh, collaborators and friends, Jörg Valrave and Misha Baranov, did not pay much attention to this Bogolubov operation, ap uh, approach in their lectures. What this Bogolubov approach, and you certainly do know about Bogolubov equations and Bogolubov method, at least you heard about that, yes, is the following. Uh, you write down psi, the field operators, psi zero plus delta psi, and then you get a bilinear Hamiltonian, which when you turn from psi operators to operators in the momentum space, looks like that, yes, right? Yes, and uh, because when you do it like that and substitute this guy right here, the terms which only contain psi zero give you the gross pitayevsky Hamiltonian leading to gross pitayevsky equation. The terms which contain delta psi in, in the power one, they vanish because of the gross pitayevsky equation. They vanish exactly whatever system you have. I remember that I was dealing with some theorists which were thinking that they are great guys, and these great guys made a mistake and were going to get effects from the Hamiltonian which contains the linear delta psi. If the gross pitayevsky equation is valid, the terms in the Hamiltonian, which are proportional to delta psi in the power of one, they vanish exactly, yes? When I was in your happy age, or slightly younger, or slightly older, I was li listening to the lectures of Spartak Belayev, who is a founder of the diagrammatic technique for bosons. And he emphasized that in his lectures. Since that time, and it was almost 50 years ago, yes, I plugged in this into my brain, and it's still there, yes. Then, but what remains in the Hamiltonian are terms proportional to delta psi squared. You, you, you represent delta psi uh, through the operators in the momentum space, and you get these operators in the power two. You get a bilinear Hamiltonian, yes. And the rest is here. And then you put the condensate, dense, the condensate wave function square root of the density. It is all contained here. So this is the equation for the operators. And then what you do, you diagonalize this by linear Hamiltonian by using a canonical Bogolubov transformation, and you get the excitation spectrum. And the excitation spectrum is of the same type as in the case of short-range interact bosons. 
in the short range interacting case, this term is epsilon, and you get the ordinary spectrum, which are phonons at low k and single particles at large k. Here, you have all this bloody term, which tells you that only when g, the short range coupling constant, is larger than this guy, d squared divided by 3, you get a dynamically stable Bose Einstein condensate. If it is smaller than this guy, from, right from this equation, you get complex frequencies at small k. And the presence of complex frequencies in the excitation spectrum means that there is a dynamical instability of a Bose Einstein condensate. The Bose Einstein condensate is not stable, it collapses. Yes? So it collapses at these angles, but it doesn't matter. So what you see now is that already in this small and simple example, we see that the Bose Einstein condensate of dipolar particles can easily become unstable. Yes? Everything depends on the comparison between the dipole-dipole interaction and the short-range interaction between particles. In, in, uh -huh. uh, what's the meaning of it collapses? What happens to the condensate? Uh, you know, uh, what happens when people uh, discuss the collapse, for example, for, for a negative scattering length and so on, they think that it collapses into points, but in reality what happens is that the density increases, yes? Once the density increases, three-body three body collisions become very important. Particles collide, recombine, form molecules, and then escape from the trap, yes? That's what, that's what is supposed to happen with these outer cold gases, yes? And that's what it is. So, I would say that uh, already from this simple example, you see that uh, it can be both a stable condensate with dipole-dipole interaction or unstable, yes? Everything depends on the geometry on, of the system, on the ratio of the dipole-dipole to short-range interaction and so on. And there are interesting cases, which I will discuss in a later stage, yes? And what I might prefer, my chairman was very polite and he said that I have time, but I may be, maybe what I will do, I would rather listen to your questions because one question I already got. And then please tell me, was there something in my lecture which was not understandable? And don't be modest. If something was not understandable, tell me simply right now. Not you, Misha, and not you, York. Mm -hmm. What? Okay, silence. Which means, which may mean two things. Everything was very clear. Second, everything was absolutely unclear. And third, you are simply very polite. Yes? <laughs> then let me... Let me make an exercise. Excuse me. Did you understand my lecture? Yes. You did. Do you now know what is gross pitayevsky equation? Uh, because I have experience with that. It's like nonlinear equation for the psi, psi of the uh, wave, psi uh -huh. of the wave function that uh -huh. it can define the whole DC uh -huh. as one wave function. Okay. Clear. Yes. But still, questions? Uh huh. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I think your lecture was very clear. Uh huh. And I have a question regarding uh, when you uh, give the solution to the Grosskopf equation. Uh huh. Um, you showed that the solution was proportional to the uh, hyperbolic tangent. Hyperbolic tension of x divided by xi, yes. Um, I think that's interesting because that wave function is not normalizable. Of course not, because it's a condensate. And the integral of the wave function modulus squared uh, 
over the distance is the number of particles. Yes, and the number of particles as density multiplied the volume. Yes. If you wish to say that it that the volume is involved, and in this sense it's not normalizable, you are right, and that's what it is. It's always the case when your system is such that you put a wall right here, and then here the system is extended to infinity, then the wave function in this sense is not normalizable. Yes. In free space, the condensate density square root of the of n, n is, is density. Then wave function is the square is density. When you integrate density over the coordinate, you get number of particles. Yes. Density multiply the volume. In this sense, you always have a situation where in your let's say understanding it's not normalizable. In, the, in a harmonic trap, it's different because there are two walls. If you put two walls in the system, then the wave function is normalizable. Yes, but that's what it is. Please, more questions? Yes. Yes. Let me approach you such that I understand the question a little bit better. Yes, I was talking about magnetic atoms, atoms with a large magnetic moment, where the magnetic dipole interaction is important. So what is the question? Yeah, but uh, my question is about the electric dipole moment. Uh -huh. uh, atoms do not have electric dipole moment. But polarized atoms by the... the the quantum vacuum fluctuation, they are not relevant? Uh, no. What you can do, and people were doing that, uh, you may try to, uh, let's say, apply a large electric field, then atoms acquire a dipole moment, yes? And then the electric dipole-dipole interaction will be present, and it will be proportional to the electric field in the square, yes. This is possible. And people were working in this direction, no problem. Or the dipole-dipole interaction can be also uh, present in the case of Rydberg atoms. You may excite an atom to a highly excited, the so-called Rydberg state, and there are Rydberg states where atoms have a dipole moment. Yes, and then you get the dipole-dipole interaction. This is true. That's what it is. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? I especially. I have a question. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, if I am, maybe I understood incorrectly, but this dipole force is not a central force because it depends on the angle of the dipoles? Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it depends on the angle between the dipole moment and the distance between particles. Mm -hmm. So, what this is, is the following. Uh, it's not centrally symmetric. If this is the dipole moment, D, and this is R, yes, it depends on this angle. Let me call it theta, yes? Right? Yeah. Then so, the question is, how would you calculate scattering length? I mean, what we have seen is calculating scattering length for central potential. Yes. This is an isotropic. Can you calculate scattering length? Uh, let us, for the moment, forget sure, the... Uh, the, 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 the... What did you show for purely? I showed it for short range interaction. Yes. And I showed that for, for the dipole-dipole interaction, there's no range. You say that you have to be normal. Yes. Uh, so yes. No, uh, because what uh, maybe in order to avoid misunderstanding in between York's lecture and mine, uh, what I said a few transparencies earlier 
is that the characteristic radius of the dipole-dipole interaction is something, which means that at distances larger than th this R star, uh, the wave function is not influenced by the dipole-dipole interaction. Yes, at smaller distances, it is. This is first, yes? So, uh, which has nothing to do with the statement that there is no, uh, no range of the dipole-dipole interaction. Second, regarding the scattering length and scattering amplitude. The quantity which is standing in the gross pitayevsky equation and later on in the excitation spectrum is related to the so-called interaction of scattering amplitude. And this interaction of scattering amplitude is given by F is equal to psi K over R, yes, V over R, exponent i k prime r, wherefore d 3 r, yes, if I am in 3 d, where for elastic scattering, the modulus of k prime is equal to the modulus of k. Psi k is the true wave function of the relative motion of two particles, yes? Then, if you are in the case which Yoke was mostly discussing, short range interaction, it is spherically symmetrical, yes, no problem. You substitute this, and then uh, for k tending to zero, yes, you obtain g equals four pi. You obtain this, uh, this constant j, which you say is proportional to the scattering length, yes, period. If you have dipole-dipole interaction, but your momentum is tending to zero. You don't care. In this case, this psi k is angular dependent. Yes, okay. But the integral is again constant. Yes. And you again get j, which is equal to something else, not short range a. But you may say that this new quantity, which is here, is also proportional to something which is scattering length. But scattering length taking into account the dipole-dipole interaction. Just because, you know, if you calculate the integral, you don't care whether this guy is angular dependent or not. If it is, you substitute the angular dependence as it is and obtain a new constant, period. And it's again constant. But what is important is that if the relative momentum is not zero, then uh, the interaction amplitude becomes momentum dependent, yes? And this momentum dependence is something which originates from the so-called anomalous scattering. Then this is very important, and there is an extra term if I actually look here. Yes, this is this term, yes, which for k equals zero is zero, yes, that's what it is. And uh, again, if you are dealing with k equals zero, you get again a certain g, which may depend on the dipole moment, but it's a constant, yes. So. Regarding your question, what to do with the scattering length, it's, uh, it's actually, it, it's more a semantic question at this point, yes? For short-range interaction, you clearly identify what is the scattering length, and the scattering length which you identify is such that it enters the phase shift for the S-wave scattering, minus Ka. When you are dealing with this dipole-dipole interaction, this is not completely true. Yes, but the physics is similar. For k equals zero, you again get a certain constant, period. Please, more questions? Oh. 
What I have done, I have finished a little bit earlier than necessary. Yes? Are people happy if the lectures and questions are finished earlier than they, than they are supposed to be finished or not? Yes. Please. What I do not see, I do not see questions from the ladies. Yes. The female part of the of the audience. You don't have questions, you understood everything, or you misunderstood everything. No? So, no response. Okay. Then it's a matter of the chairman yes. what to do. Yes? Let's thank uh, Professor Sviatinkov, and uh, we restart in half an hour. Okay, thank you. What I should do, perhaps, who was equipping me with all this? Oi, 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 oi. This means that the ground state which you selected